Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I understand that we have started the live event. My name is Barbara Barbas. I'm a lector in multi-level regulation at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. And together with Hanna Falkiewicz, uh, who is a law student at the Hague University, we will be moderating the event. Um, let me first start with a short introduction to the current events in Poland and abroad. And then I move on to uh, the introduction of our speakers and the format of the event. Uh, on uh, 22nd of October 2020, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal decided that abortion in case of severe fatal defects is unconstitutional. This ruling distorted the so-called abortion uh, compromise existent in Poland for around 27 years now, based on the law on uh, family planning of 1993. According to this law, abortion was legal only in three cases in Poland. First, if the pregnancy was a result of criminal act, such as rape or incest. Second, when the woman's life or health was at risk, and third, if the fetus was irreparably damaged. So why was the judgment issued? Um, in 2016, there was a citizen initiative that was launched by anti-abortion movement that proposed a bill that was discussed in the parliament. This triggered already then a wave of protests of Polish women and other participants, which was called the Black Protest, and it forced the parliament to abandon the project. The anti-abortion movement, unfortunately, didn't give up. In 2019, 119 members of the parliament representing PiS, which is the governing party in Poland, and two other right-wing parties referred a question to the Constitutional Tribunal whether or not abortions of pregnancies unrelated to rape or not threatening the mother's life are constitutional. As we already know, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal responded negatively. Because around 98% of all pregnancy terminations in Poland are a result of the severe fatal defects, with this judgment, the Constitutional Tribunal almost completely banned abortion in Poland. Women again uh, reacted by joining protests in Poland and around the world, which triggered further political, social and legal developments. Today, we want to discuss those developments with our experts and give students and other participants an opportunity to ask questions. So let me now welcome and introduce our speakers. And I would already like to stress to uh, the viewers that we have some technical uh, problems. So one of our speakers is uh, on the phone and two of them are trying to connect and hopefully we will uh, they will be with us soon. Uh, so uh, we do not yet have uh, with us Marta Achler. She is a senior legal advisor at the European Center for Not for Profit Law and a lawyer in the field of international law and international human rights law. Hopefully Marta will join us later. Uh, we have Pola Cebulak, which I will try to put on the screen now. Pola is uh, assistant professor in European law at uh, University of Amsterdam. We have Eva Hofmanska, who, who is a PhD lawyer and academic and legal expert at the Trust Fund for Victims the, at the International Criminal Court. She's with us on the phone, so unfortunately we cannot see her, but she will be participating uh, in our discussion. We do have uh, present Agnieszka Bienkacała, who is a professor in constitutional law at Nicolas Copernicus University in Torun, Poland. And we are still waiting to connect with uh, Ms. Eliza Rutinowska, who is a lawyer at the Civil Development Forum and trainee attorney at the Warsaw Bar Association. So hopefully we can uh, get in contact with Marta and Eliza very soon. Uh, if not, we will uh, have them for another discussion in the future. So what is the purpose and uh, format of the event today? 
Uh, we really want to have a discussion with experts on what is happening in Poland and internationally uh, for students and participants. Uh, our discussion will be mostly on the legal aspects of the current developments because we mostly have lawyers and academic lawyers with us. It will be organized in three main teams. First, we will start with the judgment itself. Second, we would like to discuss the protests. Uh, and third, we want to discuss women rights in comparative contexts. Uh, our two experts who are to discuss um, protests are not with us, so this program may be subject to change. And we will end with a brief discussion on what will or should happen next and what we as academic students, other participants can do uh, in response to the current events. So I will moderate the discussion. I will ask our experts a few questions and these questions will be just conversation starters. So feel free to uh, answer them and answer also other questions. And this will be followed by 10 minutes Q&A moderated by Hannah. Uh, how you can get involved in Q&A. Uh, you as participants, you can write down your questions in our live chat and then Hannah will be publishing them and uh, bringing them up to the panel. So we will have uh, two or three teams depending on uh, uh, technical uh, possibilities. And uh, then we will have 15 minutes of the discussion and uh, 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, I think we are ready to start with our first panel. So we have uh, Agnieszka Bienkacała and we have Eva Kaufmańska on the phone. Um, and I would like to start with the first question to Eva. Yes, yes I'm ready, hello. Yes, Eva. good morning, good afternoon Eva. So let me first ask you the question about the legitimacy of the current constitutional tribunal. So the judgment was rendered by the constitutional tribunal that since 2015 when peace got into power has largely become a political organ of peace. So my question to you is twofold. Uh, what is the role of constitutional tribunal in Poland and uh, is the current tribunal a legitimate organ? Yes, so um... I would say in a democratic state governed by the rule of law, there is a division of powers. The constitution clearly states that the judicial authority is separate and independent from the other authorities, which are legislative and executive powers. Um, according to Polish constitution, the judicial power is exercised by the courts, including the constitutional court. The role of the Constitutional Court is provided for in uh, the Polish Constitution. According uh, to it, the court rules, among others, on compliance of parliamentary acts and international treaties with the Constitution. So, generally speaking, the Constitutional Court's primary task is the judicial control of the constitutionality of law. In light of the Constitution, we can say that the Constitutional Court is a separate constitutional body independent from other courts. Its system functioning, the way it is appointed and the legal status of its judgments make it completely independent of other judicial authorities such as the Supreme Court or the Supreme Administrative Court. What is important, the Constitutional Court adjudicates abstractly which means that it is not possible for the court to rule on an individual case, like, for example, in Germany. So, um, regarding to the second part of your question, uh, which is, um, is the current uh, constitutional court's legitimate organ? I can say that the current constitutional court is not composed properly. Lawyers call it a quasi-court, because the court is currently ruling in an unconstitutional composition. There are two reasons for this, in my opinion. Mr. Duda, the president of Poland, refused to appoint to the judicial office the judges who had been properly elected in the previous term of the parliament and appointed the incorrectly elected persons in their place. Moreover, persons 
elected to not meet requirements provided for by law. For me, as well as for many other lawyers, it is obviously the aim of these efforts was to fill the constitutional court by persons dependent on the ruling party, which is not justice. So I only remind that the destruction of the constitutional court started in 2015, soon after Law and Justice won the parliamentary election in October. It was then that Polish people took to the streets for the first time to protest against the law and justice method of exercising power in Poland. Today, there is only one judge of the Constitutional Court elected not by law and justice in 2012. So, in light of the Constitution, the Constitutional Court is composed of 15 judges elected individually by the same, which is the lower house of the parliament, for nine years from among those with outstanding legal knowledge. Successive appointment to the court of people from the same political party with formed views has resulted in the court losing its independence. It has become a convenient tool in the hands of the ruling political party in Poland the result is that the court so formed decides on the constitutionality of the law created by law and justice and states that the provisions of law with which the ruling party doesn't agree on the viewpoint are inconsistent with the constitution. It was needed for the ruling party because it didn't achieve the constitutional majority in the parliament. So the logic of this populistic party is as follows. If you are not able to change the constitution, you need the dependent constitutional court in order to introduce unconstitutional reforms. It is therefore no wonder that lawyers, and not only they, are questioning the legitimacy of the current composition of the courts to give independent judgments. Lawyers call the current constitutional court sometimes the court of Mrs. Przełamska, who is the president of this court, underline at the same time that is, it is not the constitutional court within the meaning of the constitution. And at the time, lawyers call judgments of this court pseudo-judgments to stress that all documents issued by this court are not real judgments within the meaning of law as the court which delivers it is not a real constitutional court within the meaning of the Polish constitution. I think that there is also one more question uh, which we should ask. Why was, why was it the constitutional court, not parliament, who decided on legality, legality of abortion? And I would say this case was the subject of consideration by the Constitutional Court because such a motion was submitted to examine the conformity with the Constitution of the provisions of the Act of 1983 on family planning, protection of the human fetus and conditions of admissibility of termination of pregnancy. So in theory, the Parliament could have changed this Act because law and justice is the ruling political party which has regular majority in the parliament. I think that the law and justice didn't do that, as in this case, there was a risk that the potential revision would not be accepted even by the members of its party. Changing the act on family planning by the parliament would be legally more correct solution because the constitution doesn't deal with the legality of abortion. For example, according to Article 38 of the Constitution, Eva, excuse me, I would need to interrupt you because we got the into uh, there was some small technical issue. But I would uh, also like to interrupt you already a little bit at this stage and uh, uh, summarize maybe on the first question about the legitimacy of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. And uh, so that we can maybe understand step by step what are the legal problems also when it comes to formal questions with the judgment. Yes. So with, uh, before we go into the, the actual judgment and what it states and uh, what, are, uh, what rights 
are uh, potentially violated there or what is the mm -hmm. judgment itself. I would like to also ask a question to uh, Agnieszka if she would like to add anything to this discussion about the current status of the Constitutional Tribunal and how is the current judgment treated by Polish state organs? Mm -hmm. So Eva, I'm uh, now addressing this question to Agnieszka. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, this is uh, this perspective uh, that was uh, drawn a few minutes uh, ago is uh, obviously this perspective of uh, liberal constitutionalism. And in this uh, meaning, we should agree with uh, uh, the problem with the legitimacy of uh, the constitutional court and how uh, the system looked like. But in my opinion, uh, we have also the possibility to build a new type of constitutionalism, illiberal constitutionalism. And after that, if we agree that such kind of uh, constitutionalism uh, could be theorized, then we will see something more. Because this is not only uh, breaching the constitution, what do constitutional court or does constitutional court or uh, other organs of um, Polish state like parliament or government, but this um, has uh, its own logic. So in my opinion, uh, we can say that uh, the judgment of constitutional uh, court uh, was uh, uh, decided because of this uh, shifted role of the constitutional court in or within the illiberal uh, constitutionalism. Now we see how the constitutional court uh, is used as an enabler, I would say, uh, of parliament or of government. Uh, the constitutional uh, tribunal in uh, this uh, meaning seems to be servant of political will. So it is activated when it is in line of political demand of government or parliament, or frankly speaking, not on those organs, but obviously Jarosław Kaczyński, who is uh, now he is a member of uh, government, uh, but previously uh, he was only the president of the leading party and uh, sometimes he was described as uh, um, informal authority. And this is true that whole system was uh, adjusted to, to uh, his uh, demands. Uh, so uh, we can say that uh, um, that we can we can observe a division of uh, attitudes toward the constitutional court. Uh, for the governing majority, this is a legitimate court uh, which uh, uh, assess the situation uh, in accordance with uh, the constitution, binding con constitution. Uh, and for uh, the other, uh, for the opposition and uh, those who follow this liberal constitutionalism, uh, we, because I am also liberal constitutionalist, we can say that this is uh, not legitimate, but the function from this uh, illiberal constitutionalism is known, yes? So we uh, will see that uh, the constitutional court is used uh, in uh, purpose, yes, to enable, enable uh, um, this uh, demand, political demand of uh, the government, parliament and Jarosław uh, Kaczyński. Okay, Agnes, if I may jump in here. Yeah. Uh, so something about the facts. So uh, that's very important also for us to know um, in the context of theories, but we would also like to maybe understand what is currently happening with this judgment. Yeah. Uh, so um, we mentioned that the, a few people, quite a few people, especially opposition and the lawyers, academics, contest the legitimacy of the current tribunal. But what does it mean for the judgment itself? Uh, in my opinion, the judgment is uh, binding. 
Yes, it is judgment because we don't have uh, in constitution we don't have any uh, procedure uh, to to deal with the judgments of uh, constitutional court. It is binding because uh, it cannot be changed by constitutional court or other courts. Yes, and we are waiting for um, for publication. And since the since the publication, uh, uh, the judgment. Uh, affects uh, will affect the um, uh, legal order. So the legal provisions that were um, questions, uh, they uh, won't have this uh, legal uh, force. Yes, after yes, publication, but the, the, the judgment mm -hmm. is not pub has been not published yet. And we yes, don't know, so frankly, if it uh, it will be published. Yes, this is also the sign of uh, the illiberalization of the system. So just to add to this, maybe for our participants, uh, all law uh, in Poland uh, or judgments uh, become uh, uh, all law basically, because of course we are a civil law system, needs to be published through the official journal of laws, and yes, uh, the exactly. same. Uh, refers to the judgments of the constitutional tribunal. So until yes. that moment, we uh, probably cannot say that the, the judgment will be officially is officially published. So what Agnieszka is referring to, she's mentioning that, of course, the judgment is there. I don't think there is yes. any uh, justification yet. However, the judgment is there, uh, but it's not yet pu published through these official uh, channels. And uh, yeah. could you tell us also a little bit more about this? Because this is part of the political uh, discussions now. Yeah, the political discussion is uh, obviously it is connected with this uh, legitimacy of the Constitutional Court and this, um, yeah, how to uh, describe it, uh, uh, yeah, this irregularities uh, in the composition of uh, constitutional court. So this um, element uh, uh, is seen also um, as affecting uh, the binding force or the legal force of the judgment. Um, and yes, this is difficult question because, uh, as I said, if we consider constitution as a binding legal act, uh, we cannot uh, deny its consequences. Yes. So in my opinion, as I said, this is a binding, but the effects of this judgment are not yet uh, an element of the um, legal order because it is not published. But we know that in accordance to uh, constitutional tribunal, the law is not conform with the constitution. Thank you very much. So what is the main, uh, just to also briefly summarize, and this can be also a question to Eva uh, or Agnieszka, whatever you feel is best. They're very interesting to understand what are the current uh, steps of other political organs. Uh, so um, what is now happening with this judgment and what is uh, happening around this judgment? So uh, Agnieszka or Eva, would, uh, who would like to tell us more about it? Well, I can I can maybe start because <laughs> um, I have to say that um, just you know regarding to what Agnieszka said just before about binding this judgment, uh, I have to say that I can see two possible uh, theses of this matter because first one um, and I think that lots of people, not only lawyers, think the same that um, uh, this judgment cannot be binding because um, the, judges, uh, the judges of the Constitutional Court are not elected in accordance with any provision. So as a result, all documents which persons sitting in issue are not judgments within the meaning of the law, but only their statements as they are not judges. Of course, we know that this approach, although legally justifiable, leads to legal chaos. So another point, uh, what Agnieszka said, uh, is constantly presented also by the officials to the, of the ruling party and is based on the legitimacy of the current composition of the court to give judgment. And this approach allows to consider whether or not the court's judgment of 22nd October is binding. 
If we follow this logic, we would have to say that this judgment is not yet in force as it has not yet been published, as Agnieszka said. But um, regarding to your question, what are the current legal options solving the conflict? Uh, so, in my opinion, there is no good solution at the current stage. Of course, based on the conviction that a quasi-court judgment doesn't exist in a legal sense, there is no need to do anything. The problem is that the state authorities will take the judgment seriously. And uh, as a result, doctors will stop carrying out prohibited treatments because of the treat of criminal responsibility. And women will simply be afraid to get pregnant. So for lawyers, there are, in my opinion, uh, two legal options to resolve the problem. First one is to determine that the quasi-judgment doesn't exist based on the lack of legal legitimacy of the current constitutional court. This option is completely unrealistic, of course, because uh, this would mean that the ruling party had to mean calling into question the whole process of change consistently demolishing Poland from 2015. And this process has been based from the outset on unconstitutional solutions legitimized by a politically dependent quasi-constitutional court. And but another solution could be a revision of the constitution. The judgment would be out of date if the pattern was changed through the prism of which the constitutionality of the Family Banning Act was examined. This solution is equal unrealistic because the ruling party has no majority in the parliament that is required to amend the constitution. Law and justice has majority in the parliament to change a law, but not the constitution. So, in addition, it would have to be a change that clearly defines the conditions under which abortion is acceptable, which is unacceptable, unacceptable to conservatives. So, yeah. Thank you <laughs> very much, opinion. Eva uh, and Agnieszka. So I would like to just summarize that this problem and this judgment, uh, the problem with this judgment, of course, has many different layers. Of course, there is a formal question of whether this judgment can be officially binding or not. And it's disputable from what you both uh, discussed. And the second question, of course, refers to what, in fact, this judgment means for Polish women and women rights. And I think this is also an important thing because we uh, and I would just like to stress that now our president uh, Duda, he, he proposed his own bill that would be another compromise. Uh, but this bill is also uh, paused or put on hold in the parliament due to the current protests. And the bill basically is, comes very close to the original abortion compromise. So it allows uh, three uh, situations in which abortion will be permitted, but there is no political consensus for that either. So the question is quite political at the moment and the parliament is uh, decided to suspend its um, operation for the next two weeks. So the situation is quite dynamic. And of course, uh, as we can see, and as I would like to summarize before the Q&A, the question has many layers and it goes deeply into the uh, crisis of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, and uh, which started uh, with uh, coming into power of the current party. So I would like now to give, thank you very much for these initial comments, Agnieszka and Eva. Uh, Eva, I will still have you on the phone because now I yes. would like to, uh, Hannah to moderate the chat and uh, address maybe some other questions to the two of you and other panelists. So Hannah, the floor is yours. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see any questions yet, so please go ahead if you want to know something uh, more or if anything is not clear yet. And... Uh, yeah, I will wait a second maybe for the questions. Yes, yeah, so yeah, we have yeah, oh, something. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, as, as you said, uh, it is a really difficult situation because uh, we are not uh, clear about uh, what to think and what to, how to act. Yes, to resolve this uh, this problem, uh, we have two problems. One is with uh, our system, with the tri tri constitutional tribunal. 
uh, existence and action competences, how it uh, how it operates in the system, because um, I think that yes, uh, that the system this is uh, which is occupied by the ruling party um, assess this uh, elements as a binding uh, uh, judgments and the constitutional tribunal in this meaning is very strong constitutional uh, court that can uh, influence the whole system build whole system uh, and uh, obviously um, it can be um, uh, questioned and the second issue is connected with uh, with the abortion, as you said. And I I feel that uh, we don't have proper legal solutions for uh, this problem, abortion problem, because we cannot. We as polls, as I see it, we cannot uh, discuss, deliberate, and uh, come up with consensus. We don't know what it what it is. So. Uh, I feel that uh, there is an um, offer um, uh, from uh, the Commissioner of, of Human Rights that we should uh, open wide uh, national debate on uh, abortion. And I, I really, I am not sure if it is enough. In my opinion, it should be like that. We should discuss this problem and uh, uh, to, to, to make a consensus. But I am not sure if we are able to do this under um, peace party uh, role. Yeah. So thank you. This is what I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. That's uh, absolutely uh, interesting to hear. But I think that we are not able to do this uh, with any governing party. Frankly, it's such a especially sensitive issue in Poland as a uh, quasi-Catholic country where the influence of church is so uh, broad. So um, maybe uh, Eva, if you allow, I would like to now move actually to Pola because Pola uh, will tell us a little bit more on the woman's right to abortion in comparative perspective. So maybe you could also tell us something more. How is the abortion law in Poland now looking and how, where Poland is now on the European or international map? Uh, yes, so thanks a lot. I, uh, I'm also uh, doing uh, research on uh, the role of courts and international courts, so I'm also very interested in the, the aspect of uh, the role of courts in uh, such uh, socially divisive and like politically salient issues as abortion. Uh, but maybe here indeed I wanted to highlight a bit the, the perspective uh, beyond Poland that this is uh, that the current uh, wave of uh, protests and the struggles about abortion are uh, about abortion rights or women's reproductive rights are a transnational issue. It's not something that is uh, only specific to Poland. I mean even uh, the, um, the black protests were in a way inspired in terms of the use of black protests by uh, women's protests in Iceland in 1975. So it already comes from the um, from even the origins here. And I think like to basically maybe react on uh, what Agnieszka just mentioned about a possibility for um, for a bigger debate. I think here often the Irish example has um, has been um, analyzed where in Ireland uh, is uh, also a country with uh, a long um, tra Catholic tradition and a Catholic majority and Ireland had a constitutional ban on abortion which meant that even the Irish uh, parliament could not pass rules legislating on uh, uh, on abortion because uh, it was set out at the constitutional level that all abortion was only allowed in cases of serious danger to the health of the mother. And uh, Ireland in uh, 2018 uh, passed a constitutional amendment uh, that uh, changed this uh, constitutional ban and allowed for legislation uh, for in a way regular legislation by the parliament on abortion. And uh, this was uh, this change happened first of all through a referendum where a majority of people participating in the referendum voted uh, for liberalizing abortion rules 
And secondly, before the referendum, the, the, propose, the, um, the proposed change was deliberated in like smaller committees that were composed of citizens representing various citizens groups. So that's also one of kind of more modern methods used for um, for especially changing constitutions that you have also deliberations in smaller groups to try to establish a draft, a proposal of a new law that might be acceptable to many social groups uh, uh, by kind of first uh, discussing this and planning this in smaller um, settings. So that's something that also has been used to change the constitution of Iceland and uh, uh, elsewhere. So in terms of methods or tools that are used out there in the world. And obviously, I think it's also maybe the last point on the kind of comparative perspective, because we are currently kind of still waiting for the official results of the elections in the United States. I guess that is something that uh, is often distracting many of us today. Uh, so uh, in, in the United States, we also see a very strong polarization that uh, in, in the elections that like one way or another, it will be a tight uh, election result uh, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And uh, this is something that I guess it's to some extent shared uh, with Poland in a very different context on other matters. But I do think that uh, the consequence of such political polarization is also then uh, that there are certain issues that will sparkle one of these groups that is close to, a to 50 percent in a society. And I think that actually uh, the abortion issue has such a potential in the United States as well. So we do already see that uh, Donald Trump one week before the election upon appointed Amy Cohen Barrett, a conservative judge to the US Supreme Court which means that basically he managed during his mandate as US president to construct a conservative majority in the US Supreme Court. And this last appointment was especially uh, justified or kind of inspired by uh, her views on, uh, on Roe v. Wade, which is the US uh, famous case of the US Supreme Court, um, which uh, allowed for uh, liberalization of abortion rights in the States. Uh, so this is something that might be also overturned at some point in the United States. That's not kind of and uh, that's not science fiction in terms of uh, the current composition of the US Supreme Court. Uh, so I think that uh, it's also likely to to trigger such kind of social unrest and uh, backlash in the in the society in the United States as well. So that's also in terms of the broader comparative context. That's really interesting. Uh, also, we'll probably uh, ask Elisa once we have her online, what is in fact happening on the streets of Poland and what are the political and social consequences? Uh, because we know that the, the protesters are already not only protesting for women's rights, which are itself very uh, important uh, aspect of the process, but they also make political postulates. So there is some political activism uh, waking up uh, or awakening in Poland. Uh, and of course, I think it has, of course, international consequences. I think the uh, uh, political consequences of uh, these acts are uh, there are similar mechanisms all over the world and we can see what is happening in Poland is also has uh, its consequence. Uh, well, it ha the same mechanism happens in all populist countries, including the US, as we can currently uh, say that it. Uh, um, so I would like Paula maybe also to ask you if you could uh, say a little bit more about the European perspective. Uh, so mm -hmm. we know that Poland uh, has been subject of the proceedings in in the EU in relation to the rule of law um, and uh, how these protests or how the current political situation in Poland affects the uh, where we are in the European Union. Um, yes, so that's uh, definitely kind of the, the broader um, context of kind of uh, yeah, Polish relationship with uh, international organizations with kind of global governance structures here. And I think if you allow, because I think there are basically two kind of important European organizations for uh, for this matter in particular. One is the European Union and another I see a question from Johanna in the chat uh, is uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. So basically the Council of Europe. 
So we have on the one hand the Council of Europe, which is a bigger European organization, including uh, Turkey, Russia, um, Azerbaijan, that um, is uh, particularly devoted to issues concerning um, democracy, fundamental rights, and that's the organization that hosts the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And that's a court that uh, can decide on individual claims uh, regarding human rights violations, regarding violations of the European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, this court has, uh, has in the past decided about abortion, and um, especially with regard to abortion rights in Poland. But um, this court has, uh, has never decided that there is an obligation for a member state uh, to introduce abortion rights. It rather has decided about how those countries implement the rights that they have already. So basically, what um, if Poland uh, beforehand in uh, the previous um, uh, law in Poland that is called the abortion compromise, I think even that is highly disputed nowadays whether we should call it a compromise because it gives it a certain legitimacy because it was actually a very extreme compromise in the sense that it was already super restrictive uh, abortion law that only allowed abortion in three cases, basically, uh, if it's a result of rape, if it's a result of a criminal act, the pregnancy, if it's a serious danger to the health of the mother or serious danger to the health of the child. And uh, in those settings, even in practice, it, was, it has been very difficult to obtain a legal abortion in Poland, even if uh, one of these cases has been confirmed in a way. So, uh, and this is where the European Court of Human Rights has intervened in the past to say, like, if you have these laws allowing for an abortion, if a pregnancy is a result of rape, you have to at least enforce them in a way. So, and this is, um, there were judgments re regarding uh, Mrs. Tishon's or uh, a more recent case uh, in 2012 was PNS versus Poland, which was a case of a, uh, a teenage pregnant girl uh, that indeed had the prosecutor confirming that it was uh, the pregnancy was a result of an illegal act and that still had a lot of trouble to uh, get access to a legal abortion. Uh, in the end, she was transported across the whole country in the middle of the night by some black limousine to get an abortion 800 kilometers away from her hometown without her parents present and things like this. Uh, so in this setting, the, the European Court of Human Rights went actually very far and said that Poland violated not only her right to, uh, to family life but, uh, and right to privacy, but also her right to be free from torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. So that was the first time ever that the court in such a case regarding reproductive rights used Article 3 of the European Convention, which basically says that countries should not torture or subject uh, people to inhuman and degrading treatment. And the court said that what this little like teenager girl, uh, teenage girl went through amounted to such inhuman and degrading treatment. And so this is uh, one context where I guess um, uh, there might be consequences. In practical terms, one has to also say though that uh, before filing a case to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, individuals have to what is called exhaust national remedies. So they have to go through all of the instances at the national level before they apply to the court in Strasbourg, which that's why I'm saying practically uh, here takes ages. So uh, this is something that would not intervene fast in the debate, but there would have to be actual cases of also damage happening and uh, also then a case that would be admissible to, uh, to go to the court in Strasbourg. So that is not something that is likely to happen fast. On the other hand, I, um, I do think that what we can read from the case law of the court in Strasbourg is that a total abortion ban might be contrary to the European Convention on Human Rights. It, this is something that the court has never said expressly, I emphasize, but I... Uh, uh, but from what it has expressed uh, more obiter dictums that uh, because it never had to decide this question, um, I would say that it's not unlikely that such a more restrictive ban would be contrary. And uh, if I can... Can you still hear me? 
Paula, so uh, thank you very much for that. I'm sorry I, you, uh, it, you cut off, so I don't know if you are responding to a chat or uh, I just would like to follow up with the question. Uh, what about the uh, discussion on the rule of law? Uh, so what if, uh, of course, the council, we can wait for the reactions from uh, European courts, of course, uh, it will take time until there can be any follow up, of course. However, what about the formal uh, aspects of the uh, in the Independence and impartiality of courts in Poland, and whether this uh, discussion that is happening now can fall within the current discussion on independence and impartiality of judiciary in Poland generally, that is now subject to the proceedings in the EU. Um, definitely. So I would say that from uh, from the EU side. Uh, there are basically two threats, uh, two kind of major uh, uh, threats that uh, Poland could be kind of facing. And uh, I think that uh, the recent developments and this particular judgment from the 22nd of October can contribute to uh, those threats. One is uh, uh, to be to go to the extreme in a way. One is suspension of voting rights of Poland as a member state of the European Union. Um, it's uh, at the moment of interruption, but I think I should be now connected again. So um, in terms of the the threats, one is the suspension of voting rights of Poland, uh, which is possible according to Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union. It obviously in this uh, extreme case it requires uh, unanimity of all other member states uh, voting for this in the Council, uh, which is also under current political circumstances unlikely. Um, however, uh, the way that um, Pol Poland EU relations have been developing, it's uh, it's definitely it has been escalating, and um, uh, in that sense, uh, the law and justice government has also been behaving differently to the Hungarian government, which is uh, still affiliated with a major political party in the European Parliament and has been uh, always, in a way, trying to implement judgments of the Court of Justice, uh, whereas uh, the Polish government is lately escalating the situation a little bit and is kind of losing its political allies. This would be a political measure indeed to suspend voting rights of Poland. Uh, in uh, it, This would be decided by the Council, so the representatives of all other member states in the European Union. So basically 26 out of 27 member states, because without Poland, would have to vote for this. The other threat, the second threat that Poland is facing with regard to the European Union is that uh, is the stop to, of the flow of funds from the European Union. Um, currently, we are at a stage where the Council and the Parliament, so the two kind of legislative organs of the European Union, have agreed on, uh, have basically agreed on a text of a new rule about introducing conditionality uh, for uh, EU structural funds, meaning th that if member states do not fulfill certain rule of law requirements, uh, structural funds of the EU can be stopped. And for that only qualified majority voting in the council is needed, so we don't have this kind of unanimity situation where Viktor Orban could protect uh, the Polish government. Um, so those are a bit the two kind of concrete mm, threats, which are still maybe not as uh, immediate, but. Thank you very much. I think that the government wasn't actually expecting what is happening uh, together with this judgment. I think everybody seems to be also surprised. Uh, so uh, we will see, of course, what happens next and whether any further action from the EU will uh, take place. Uh, I would like to now, uh, Paula, let you rest for a moment and uh, we will have uh, a sec uh, another panelist um, who is uh, on the line. I hope uh, that Eliza Rutinowska can hear us. Eliza, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We're very Wonderful. happy to uh, to be able to connect the, uh, through the phone. So let me again introduce Eliza to all of you. Eliza is a lawyer at the Civil Department uh, Development Forum, excuse me, in Poland, and she's actually very close with the demonstrators. She knows what is happening. She's now based in Poland and she will tell us a little bit more what uh, 
what in fact is happening there. So Elisa, could I uh, could we start by a short summary of uh, what is happening on the streets of Poland and uh, how are the rights of protesters uh, observed or not? Um, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be with all of you here today, even if just via phone. Um, but you know, these are circumstances that we have to deal with. Um, yes, what is happening on the street today? Um, well, we are amidst a very peaceful and a very feminine revolution. Um, I believe it's something that has been staring up in, in, in many people uh, over the past years. Um, of course, today we're going to be focusing on the issue of the abortion ban. Um, but you must keep in mind that a lot of the protesters are actually calling for the dismissal of the entire government, not only because of the uh, of this one, um, you know, situation with the abortion ban, but of you know, but because of years and years of curbing um, and and actually limiting um, citizens' freedoms and our rights as as people. Um, so that's that's just a short intro. Um, so actually, um, we've been witnessing protests on the streets for a while now. Um, back in August, um, protesters took to the streets because of the way LGBTI um, activists were treated um, in an appalling manner. And that's when um, a rainbow team of, of defenders, of human rights defenders, of, of attorneys and the trainee attorneys like myself, um, have decided to rally together and create a group um, which was based, which, which is right now based on one phone number um, that all the protesters can just uh, write on their arms and call us whenever they get stopped uh, or detained by the police. Um, and that's how we work. So we're basically this kind of 24 7 um, call and lawyer. Um, a, for all the protesters. Uh, this started in Warsaw, seeing as, you know, the protests from August um, happened here. But currently, because of the, um, you know, countrywide uh, phenomenon of, of the uh, abortion ban protests, um, a lot of our, our cities have these um, types of numbers um, that you can call and receive a pro bono legal aid. Um, so that's just the technical part of the of the issue. Um, there are about 70 lawyers right now uh, working on this issue in Warsaw alone. Um, that kind of gives you the idea of, of the scale that we are dealing with. Um, last Friday, um, we were talking about um, around 400,000 uh, people out on the streets, and those are the official um, uh, the statistics from the police department, and we know that they're always, um, right now, they're always, um, you know, downgraded. So we're thinking that around um, 800,000 people could have easily taken to the streets of, of bigger cities and smaller ones as well. Um, when the protests erupted after the abortion ban ruling went through, um, they were a lot less. Um, friendly than they are now. They were um, they were really an expression of complete and utter disbelief of everyone involved. Um, we were all all of us human rights defenders were sure, um, and the lawyers um, as well. Uh, it, we were sure that this ruling would not go through. That they would you know push it back, push it back, and kind of keep it in the freezer as the sort of you know um, uh, threat to actually have over the heads of Polish women um, so that they would know that, you know, something like that could happen if they were not if they were not going to cooperate with the government. Instead, what happened was the government decided to take the leap and actually, um, you know, start their autumn or fall defensive uh, offensive lines, as we call it here. Um, why am I talking about the government in the context of the Constitutional Tribunal. Shouldn't, you know, courts be independent? Of course they should be independent. Um, and that is why we, uh, you know, the, all the Polish lawyers involved in the rule of law fight are not, do not agree with calling the current Constitutional Tribunal uh, a Constitutional Tribunal. So we always use the word sham or, um, you know, misplaced or, or, or quasi 
um, constitutional tribunal because of the nature of how it was um, created. So the so three of the judges that are currently uh, sitting in the tribunal are actually the so-called uh, double judges. They were elected um, as, uh, as doubles uh, to places that should have been taken by uh, others, um, uh, but they were chosen instead um, because they were more um, cooperative with the current ruling party. Um, you must also know, and I'm sure that you know this has been mentioned, that uh, the doublers took place, uh, took part in, in actually uh, giving out this ruling. So that's the first formal um, argument that we have that it's not really a ruling, it's not really a binding judgment. Um, and the second argument that we have and we are pushing through as Polish lawyers um, is the fact that one of the judges um, who, who, who ruled on this issue was actually one of the, uh, was formerly an MP who signed um, the, 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 the motion which actually initiated the entire proceeding. So basically we have a judge ruling um, in her own favor. Um, so these are the two major formal issues we have with the ruling, um, not even getting into the entire, um, you know, m merit of, of the judgment. Um, so we, always, we also call it the quasi-judgment. However, that being said, um, with the current political climate, we cannot hope for, um, you know, the, pol the politicians to actually do anything about the constitutional tribunal, which is right now a political force. Um, instead, uh, what we are hoping for is that courts themselves, common courts, um, that are entitled to rule on the basis of the Constitution itself and legal acts themselves, um, and actually uh, follow through with, the, with their own judgment over specific cases to not comply with this um, quasi-ruling. So there's this big movement to actually empower courts to do that. And uh, But back to the street. So after this ruling was uh, pushed through, um, a lot of people took to the streets, um, not only women, men as well, but the thing is, it wasn't only about the abortion. The thing is that, they, that those people know um, how this constitutional, quasi-constitutional tribunal works. So the main, um, you know, motion that is being pushed for by the protesters, it's the, the entire dismissal of, of this government. The constitutional tribunal cannot be used, cannot be continued to be used as a political force, um, as it is being used today. Um, uh, the protesters were uh, took to the streets, and then from the constitutional tribunal, they decided to walk um, towards uh, the private home of uh, one of, of the uh, of the chief of the ruling party. He had also fifteen. Um, so once they arrived there, there were a multitude of police forces deployed all around the street where he lived. Um, gas was, tear gas was used against protesters. Uh, we are, fir we firmly stand, uh, with, uh, the fact that it was used disproportionately. Um, a lot of the, uh, policemen have abused their powers. Um, and therefore, there was need for, um, for, for us as lawyers to react. Um, uh, over the next couple of days, um, multiple uh, meetings took place, multiple gatherings took place with the police forces, always, you know, calling on them to um, go home, you know, that saying that it's illegal to hold these spontaneous gatherings, which is a lie. Um, I'm not afraid to to call it a lie. Um, for the past couple of months, we have been operating as a country under the uh, so-called state of epidemic. Um, however, the government has abused their power in the sense that they have used um, a lot of state of emergency laws um, uh, and actually mirrored them in the current legislation. For example, saying that it's, that it's illegal to gather over five people um, you know, on the streets, and therefore, you know, spontaneous gatherings are also prohibited. That's not that's not true. You can only, under Polish law, um, that can only be prohibited under a specific state of emergency, which has not been declared. Um, so, you know, we're also, we're not only fighting um, for the rights of protesters, but we're also combating the entire legislation that we are right now um, kind of operating under. 
Um, so, so that's also a, 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 an additional difficulty. Um, Alisa, so, excuse me, if I may yeah. just interrupt, uh, it's all absolutely interesting. Uh, I would just like to uh, maybe pause on uh, COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. So you are saying that it is not uh, illegal for the uh, demonstrators to gather spontaneously now in Poland, even regardless the uh, current measures. Yes, um, yes, it's not uh, because, you know, uh, we always call on the protesters to, you know, first of all, have their, you know, reasonable hat on and, you know, keep their masks on and keep social distance as well, um, because that can actually be um, a, a pretext to, you know, give them a sign for not following hygienic, um, you know, measures. But gatherings, uh, as understood under the European Convention of Human Rights and the right to express your opinion and, um, you know, to, to protest and the right to protest um, is not, it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not prohibited. That can only happen under the state of emergency, which has not been declared. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the same thing with a lot of r different restrictions that we have been seeing in, in Poland today. Um, so the same goes for masks. You know, it, it's only good reason that people are wearing them. Um, the legislation has not been um, you know, administered properly. It has not been, uh, you know, uh, we don't have the right legal basis for everyone to wear masks. And the government is not listening to lawyers. Um, and right now, we are operating under decrees which are being, you know, um, announced every Friday, basically. Um, and then, you know, calling for people to, for example, um, to dismantle once they gather um, to protest. Um, so the right to protest has not been has not been um, prohibited. Um, so that has to be mentioned, and and that's what we're also using as our argument. Of course, um, the government is right now uh, fighting back by saying that organizers of these events can be actually persecuted for um, causing um, danger to the mass public. However, again. Um, we're operating on different levels. These gatherings are usually, um, uh, at most 99%, they're uh, so-called spontaneous gatherings. Um, these types of gatherings, they don't have organizers. So really what the, what the, what the government is right now doing, or actually administers the prosecutor's office, the public prosecutor's office is to do, is to find, you know, people who um, can be, uh, you know, considered organizers of these events. That actually happened uh, to a 14-year-old girl in, 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 in Piwa, a, a small town in Warsaw. Um, so actually what happened was she went out to protest with her grandmother and she was shouting something and then one of the uh, po policemen actually went up to her and um, asked if, if, if started threatening her. Um, saying that she organized this event, um, that she had to give him her name, etc. And then she started asking people to leave because she was so scared. And that was enough for the, for the policeman to actually consider her an organizer of the event. Um, these types of actions are absolutely appalling. We have also had um, notes coming in from, from people all over the country saying that police forces are actually um, uh, coming to their houses and actually saying that and threatening them, saying that, you know, you can't organize these under the state of the epidemic. Um, you can't, you know, well, of course you can't organize a spontaneous gathering. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of the sense of a spontaneous gathering that it doesn't have an organizer, legally speaking. Um, so we do know of a official letter that was sent out to is all around the country um, actually uh, calling for, for these people to be prosecuted. Um, we do have the Vice Minister of Justice actually mirroring that statement in his public appearances. Um, we do have the Prime Minister actually accusing um, the, pro the protesters of uh, the sudden rise in, in, in COVID-19 um, in COVID-19 um, cases. Um, of course, we don't. We still don't know where he gets the data from. So, you know, we're, we're worried that you know he's just spreading misinformation. Um, and then, uh, of course, we do have the minister of education threatening um, students and threatening 
um, uh, headmasters of schools and teachers themselves uh, that if they urge the kids to engage in the protests, um, they are actually, uh, they're going to be consequences um, uh, towards these, these, uh, these people. Um, there have been instances of children getting, uh, limiting access to um, online learning for kids who decided to put the symbol of the women's strike on their profile pictures. Uh, there has been an instance at the University of Warsaw of one of the pro of one of the professors to, who actually sent out an email to all of his um, students saying that no, um, you know, no notion of the women's strike will be tolerated. Um, you know, and there will be disciplinary proceedings launched against those who openly. Um, you know, express their feelings about about the current situation. Um, it must be mentioned here that that professor is also actually a member of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court, um, which is also a sham tribunal that was uh, that is absolutely an un unconstitutional body. So um, going back to the protesters themselves, luckily we had um, fewer instances of police brutality than we did um, back in August and fewer arrests as well. Um, however, uh, there have been instances of arrests, uh, mostly young people, um, mostly activists. Um, and basically what we're doing now, along with the Warsaw Bar Association, is also launching these trainings, uh, these online trainings. Um, I'm actually joining you right now from uh, after following through with one of these trainings um, for high school students um, so that they know what their rights are. Um, so that's basically the state of play now. We are amidst um, not only these protests, but right now we have all of our um, cases from August also coming in. So it's going to be a very hectic, uh, some very hectic winter months are ahead. Thank you very much, Elisa. It's, uh, I hope you uh, stay safe and uh, uh, keep up with the great work. I think it's very important to realize uh, citizens what their rights are and especially youth and students. So on that note, I would like to ask you a question and then maybe move to Hannah in case of other questions, because I can see a question also from Paula, uh, whether you think that this current wave of protests represents the support of majority of society for liberal values, because we know that the public support uh, of the protest is quite high and uh, there is uh, so uh, how can you uh, what is your analysis of that are people supporting women are there women's right are they supporting their political postulates or are they just fighting for freedom uh, in general from oppression in the current situation in poland i think thank you so much for this question i think it's, it's, it's crucial to ask in times of like these um i be strongly believe that people right now sit to the streets um you know after hearing that ruling um due to the fact that you know there was a massive uh support system for the black uh protest back in 2016 when this idea was first raised um and that's when we managed to fight back um effectively uh this time we lost and i feel that people um had two reasons first of all they they are absolutely against you know um uh, this ruling which is appalling on so many levels um and then uh, because of the fact of how the tribunal actually was used as a political tool and people are just tired of this constant you know um uh, destruction of rule of law and this constant and very um you know consequent um destruction of of, of our democracy so i believe that they took the streets because of their will to fight for freedom, to actually regain their, um, you know, the, 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 their own rights as citizens. 
Yes, it's very interesting also uh, to see, and it's quite refreshing, uh, given that in the current elections, the majority voted for the current president, who in fact represents completely opposite values. So, uh, and we see this trend uh, not only in Poland or Europe, but as also Paula mentioned, um, we can see this also in the United States, that the, in fact the public supports populist leaders. So uh, I think it's very refreshing to see this uh, protests in Poland and around the world and the uh, international community support, if we may say so, uh, of what is happening, especially in the current, uh, uh, in view of the current political events in Poland, but also internationally. Okay, Elisa, I think I will now uh, give the floor to Hannah to ask her if there are any other questions to you. And I would like to, through this uh, medium, already connect with Marta and let her know that I will be calling yeah. her next. So Marta, please so get much. ready for a phone call. And now, Hannah, if there are still some questions for Elisa, uh, please let us know. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I have one question that uh, I received myself from some of my international friends, uh, whether it is possible to support the protest and the movement and uh, just the Polish women from abroad, uh, not only Polish nationality people, but just anyone who's concerned about what's going on. Like what ways would you advise to promote, to support the ones who are protesting in Poland? Thank you so much for this question. Um, and, and let me just send out my, my warmest wishes to the person who asked that. Um, so the thing is that right now what they're also doing is curbing our platforms of uh, speaking out. So really um, the international community can, can make sure that our voice is being heard and not only of, you know, um, uh, of uh, members of, of parliament or members of the opposition, but also of the protesters themselves and of, of, of everyone who is fighting for, uh, with, with, you know, curbing of, of civil rights. Um, I do know that a lot of governments have already decided to offer help to Polish women to um, make sure that they can access, legally access abortion um, uh, and safe abortion abroad, um, which is also a major, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's really just creating a safe haven for, for the persecuted women. Um, and just to also make sure that it's not only the women who have the means that can travel abroad that will be able to access these, uh, these services, but also those who will be hit the hardest by this uh, quasi-ruling. And that's, those are the, the poorest of our, um, of our, of our society. Um, and actually helping them with, with, with access, not only to abortion, but also to uh, just overall, uh, you know, health, uh, health measures. What we do know is that there are also difficulties with accessing prenatal care. Um, because, I mean, it, it, what's the point of diagnosing a fetus if, if, if even though it will be deformed, um, there is no way around it. Um, so we, we are uh, actually uh, apprehensive towards what can actually happen there. So that's the way, um, and also all the protests that we have seen around the, the, the Europe and around the world have been a major, major uh, motivation for us to keep on fighting. Yes, if I can add to that, there is one protest which will be organized in The Hague this Sunday. I shared the link in the Q&A, so maybe someone who's here is interesting to joining. Thank you very Thank much. You. And thank you, Elisa. I also want to let you know, Elisa, that uh, we are also in touch with the Polish community in The Hague, indeed, and in the Netherlands. And there are plans for many more protests and uh, there is a lot of support of the cause. Uh, and uh, of, we are already planning another event where we will be also connecting with those who organize protests in the Netherlands and in The Hague to hear their opinion, point of view and how supportive the Dutch society is of the um, current uh, events in Poland. So, uh, Hannah, uh, are there any other questions to Elisa? Uh, if not, I think I have a question to... Sorry, thank you very much, Hannah. If not, I think I have to uh, uh, do some uh, 
undertake some technical operations. So uh, <laughs> connect with Marta. So thank you very yeah. much, Elisa. Please take care of yourself and uh, others. And uh, thank you very much once again for uh, taking part in our discussion. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. Bye bye. So in the meantime, maybe I could ask uh, uh, Paula also a question uh, if, uh, because you also formulated this question about liberal value values. So what is your opinion about the current situation? And because it's not the protest, it's not anymore about women's rights only, but it's about liberal values uh, in general. So could you tell us more what you think uh, is happening now in Poland? Can we speak about the revolution, societal revolution? I mean, I, I know, but uh, maybe you could give us your opinion. So, uh, indeed, am I also live now? Um, so, like, I, uh, I indeed uh, do not feel like uh, an expert here because I am currently in Amsterdam and not in uh, in Poland on this. Like, I, uh, I. Uh, the question like resulted from other debates when I have uh, heard this issue being raised that there is some kind of paradigm shift when it comes to um, uh, liberal values and like it was uh, triggered um, quite a bit by Agnieszka's comment as well about the illiberal constitutionalism because I think that in that sense we really have a, an open debate here that I'm not sure can be only decided by uh, like some 52% majority kind of in a purely mathematical sense and I so for me here like one of the key kind of liberal ideas is also a sense of uh, equality and uh, individual rights that's why these human rights issues come up then so it's uh, uh, I do think that illiberal constitutionalism comes with an idea of some kind of two class of citizens that is justified in in this setting then yes so this is uh, uh, but and I I would indeed uh, this is again just to um, start the discussion on this like I would indeed say that uh, that we do see a broad support kind of for liberal values and that's something that we do see those protests kind of uh, escalating also Eva has mentioned uh, the LGBT issues that's something that indeed also um, now from the EU perspective EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union speech in her uh, yearly address to the European Parliament in terms of policy priorities mentioned that the LGBT free zones in Poland are against um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and uh, EU values. Uh, so I, if we see those issues as connected, I do see that we see a certain paradigm shift and kind of emergence of kind of majorities in favor of those liberal values. But I, I... Thank you very much, Paula. Unfortunately, I cannot get a... Uh, uh, connect with uh, Marta. So I think we should now uh, focus more on uh, wrapping up and answering questions. So uh, Hannah, uh, the floor is back to you. Uh, uh, if there are any questions that are unanswered, uh, please let us know. If not, we will go on with our discussion. Mm. Yes, there is one more question that uh, I see was already answered by Ms. Paula and Ms. Eva, uh, considering the position of uh, Ms. Pawłowicz, who was the judge in Constitutional Tribunal Court. And uh, the issue is that beforehand she uh, signed the motion to the Constitutional Court that was refused, but considered the same uh, issue. Then she became the judge and then she judged on the, the same issue. So there is a bit of uh, uh, wondering whether she will be the uh, whether she is the appropriate person to judge on this matter. But I think uh, it's still up to the discussion. And uh, from the questions, I think uh, we do not have anything. Uh, Would I more. add the question? Uh, just Miss Marta just uh, texted that uh, we can try to connect with her now. So as you connect with uh, Marta, I also wanted to ask maybe to the colleagues that know more about the Polish context about any possible strategies be behind 
uh, not publishing the reasoning of the Constitutional Court and uh, not publishing the judgment itself, what we mentioned, whether there is any kind of more rational way of explaining this? If I could say something, I don't think so that it is a rational thing, but uh, uh, as I uh, said, I, well, from this perspective of illiberal constitutionalism, it is understood because this is political decision not to publish this, this uh, judgment. I think that uh, uh, Peace Party wanted to have uh, uh, law. Uh, they opted uh, about this law, but they don't uh, wanted to engage in the discussion in the parliament. So they activated the constitutional tribunal, uh, and it it seemed that it would be easy. Yeah, but uh, eventually, um, in my opinion, they didn't expect this uh, um, protest and uh, uh, the activation of such a mass people to the, to the streets. So now they are trying to bake off. Yes, they are trying to do something um, uh, to resolve this problem. And for them, because uh, it is not the precedent, we had this precedent, yes, before, uh, with not publishing the judgment. And now we see the same technique, yeah? So we don't know what uh, what will be the result, the final result. And I don't know also, but I think that uh, it's uh, uh, definitely, uh, in my opinion, uh, the future will not be uh, liberal as uh, long as uh, peace uh, is uh, has majority, let's say. I cannot, uh, thank you very much, uh, Agnieszka. Thank you, Paula. Uh, I cannot uh, get in contact with Marta, unfortunately. So hopefully Marta can join our next discussion, which is already planned um, and give us her uh, own perspective from the perspective of international law and international human rights law. Uh, so I think we can start wrapping up this uh, discussion by uh, and I would like to uh, do this by asking you maybe an open question. What uh, should happen next. So when we don't know exactly what will happen, because we have many questions, what are your opinions? Uh, what should happen in Poland? Who should uh, uh, and it, it's a very general question from a political perspective, social perspective or legal perspective. Um, and um, the second question would be what we lawyers, academics, students, researchers should do. So, uh, Paula or Agnieszka, please feel free to start. Um, okay, then I can start maybe. I, um, so, I, I do not have a simple answer as to what should, uh, what should happen next. That's actually, um, I guess, one of the most challenging questions. So I, I do think that like um, that uh, this movement is uh, is something impressive in terms of uh, civil society and social movements uh, in Poland. So in that sense, I do um, I do hope that um, they manage to um, keep up the kind of uh, broad support and uh, the activism for this. I. Um, from the EU perspective, that uh, from the European Union perspective that I mostly study, I would kind of hope that the EU comes up with some more kind of principled way of dealing with uh, democratic values um, overall and democratic values inside of the European Union and uh, in the member states. So with regard to EU institutions themselves observing democratic values and rule of law, with regard to member states observing this, because I think that this is um, uh, crucial also for the future of European integration. We are currently in a situation when we have a lot of opportunistic political ad hoc uh, decisions on this and um, not a more kind of uh, principled approach. And um, I do think that uh, we see this in particular with, uh, with the abortion situation also transnationally that uh, 
it's obviously a social issue and uh, a political issue that probably where lawyers or judges are not the best place uh, institutions to provide a solution actually for this. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the legal structures determine also the, the channels of, uh, of social of activism and also of strategic litigation there. So I do think that uh, the, the legal framework matters a lot nonetheless here. And uh, I, I would kind of hope that we maybe also do get some more of kind of uh, political uh, parties in Poland on board to kind of reflect also the calls of, uh, of this protest, which is also currently has been, uh, uh, has been lacking. And I think in terms of uh, uh, the role of the um, academics is really also to trying to uh, to map uh, this kind of institutional legal paths towards some kind of social change. And um, so this is a bit the <laughs> review first. Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, Agnieszka, would you like to uh, say a few words? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, indeed, it is a very difficult question, and uh, obviously my answer uh, will be, uh, I don't know, not, not complex, but I see that uh, um, I see some ground, as, uh, as you said, we have uh, a legal ground, and uh, here I think that uh, uh, law or constitutional law is very uh, limited uh, in in the in possibilities to deal with uh, uh, constitutional changes or systemic changes that we uh, observe now and also this uh, abortion question because this is uh, abortion is not uh, a legal thing i in my opinion it is more ethical and uh, uh, and um, moral question. So we should deal with uh, that in other ways, like only using those legal tools. Uh, for me, education is uh, the most important things, so, but not only uh, uh, schools should be responsible for that, but also uh, parents, home, our, our all environment. And I see it uh, because I have uh, two children, two boys that are, they support the protest uh, uh, well, spontaneously and do with great uh, happiness. Yes, they are really involved in that. Uh, I see also this space for academics, for us to explain what is going on uh, what should uh, happen and how we should uh, react, how we should understand things. Because uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the most problematic uh, thing for our society, for Polish society, is that, that we, um, or schools, are uh, uh, not uh, um, deal with uh, open-mindedness. Yes, uh, 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 pupils at schools are not trained to be open mind and uh, to, to say everything uh, what is in their hearts and uh, uh, how they feel about uh, the situation. There is no discussion, as I know, because I have, as I said, to, to uh, sons uh, in schools. Um, and I see also the political, um, you know, political floral space to, to, to resolve these um, problems, but uh, uh, I am not sure, or, or maybe we should dis distinguish uh, political and uh, partisan, because political is uh, what uh, belongs to polity as a society. And here we have uh, really um, a lot of things to say. But when we look at our um, um, parliament, our say, yes, we see that there is a lot of uh, party interest. And uh, almost every party in uh, Polish uh, same is conservative. So this is real problem. Yes, because we don't know how to address those liberal things. Yes, how to uh, 
uh, deal with the value which is individual. We see something else. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Agnieszka. Definitely uh, some um, systemic change is needed uh, on many uh, fronts and I think there is a lot of for politicians also to work on with uh, different social laws supporting mothers and disabled children and uh, many other gr uh, grounds. Uh, I have uh, good news. We have uh, Marta Achler uh, on the line. Uh, it's uh, uh, we are already wrapping up, but I think uh, that uh, um, Marta, I would like to ask you uh, a question for uh, on if you could just give us your expert opinion on the current protests in Poland from the international law perspective. And I leave it very general so that you can uh, perhaps uh, decide yourself what you would like to say on what is now happening and how international law responds to that. Uh, and I also would like to ask you maybe more uh, from an innovative perspective. What about the online protests and the use of technology? Because I know you also wanted to mention this and I think that's also something for for all of us to consider and uh, uh, take into account. So I would like to ask you, Marta, if you could mute, uh, mute the discussion because I can hear the echo and then I will. You are already on the speaker and then uh, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much. Well, so good afternoon, um, Barbara and everyone. I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties um, of, of joining with you, and I'm sorry especially to have missed um, all of the presenters, or at least some of the presenters that went before me, um, because the discussions and the protests uh, continue, and I'm following them um, quite, uh, quite diligently. Um, and looking at them also um, from a point of view of international law. Um, currently, I'm with the ECNL and um, you asked about online assemblies. Well, I just finished my PhD on uh, assemblies and associations online um, and I have pre pre uh, prepared a uh, presentation for everybody to see in case you are able to put it up. Um, I would like to say is that in the case of freedom of assembly and the protests in Poland, it raises a number of interesting issues in terms of international sex, which I think are extremely robust. Applicable for those, including. Marta, I'm afraid the connection is not the best. Uh, I, it can be myself, but uh, we do not hear you. Maybe you could move a little bit. Uh, so okay. <laughs> Thank you very Let much. Let me try. Let me try. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. I will try to um, try to speak with you. Is, it, is the connection better now? Barbara? Yes, it is perfect. Okay. So um, the protests in Poland, uh, from an international point of view, have raised, I think, a number of interesting issues. One is the freedom of expression and the use of strong language. And that has been an issue of, of discussion, I guess, among some politicians and, and people commenting on uh, the, the, the protests in Poland, because some of the um, mottos that the, are being used by the protesters have been uh, considered as very strong language. The other one is uh, it's raised the issue of counter demonstration, um, which is also covered by international law. Also, spontaneous assemblies um, is an issue which has come up because um, international law does and wants to protect assemblies that are a reaction to a certain political event that is not able to be dealt with um, by people through notification to authorities earlier. It's not a regular assembly, it's one that happens as a result of a particular event. Um, the, the next point I wanted to raise is that it has also in international law, the question of assemblies and the use of force by law enforcement has also um, um, come up in the context of the protests that are taking place in Poland now. Um, also, uh, possibly this has been raised before uh, my um, intervention here, and that is 
protests which are taking place in the times of COVID um, and a pandemic are also an interesting question and whether or not such protests can be restricted as a result of the pandemic. And finally, the question that you asked, Barbara, and that's the one about online protests. So um, that's, the, that's the few points that I would like to cover. And starting from freedom of expression and use of strong language, uh, which is, I'm not sure if you have the slide up because I don't have you on the screen right now, um, but it's uh, the do. fundamental component of freedom of assembly is actually expression. And international law says that, in fact, you cannot restrict uh, the way in which uh, an assembly expresses itself to so the words that are used, because it's not just information and ideas that should be uh, passed through an assembly, it's also things that offend, shock and disturb the state or any sector of the population. And that we can find in case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And so protesters in Poland have every right uh, to uh, convey their message um, in strong language. Uh, whether or not that shocks or disturbs other people is not a question that is a problem for the law. Meanwhile, the law does draw a line um, when any language or expression incites to violence. That is where the line is drawn in terms of, um, in terms of uh, international law and protest messages. So the next point I wanted to mention is that spontaneous assemblies and counter demonstrations. These are clearly, both of them, protected by international law. Therefore, fortunately or unfortunately, the main protests should go ahead and peaceful assemblies are often organised in a spontaneous manner. So there is no uh, chance to agree with law enforcement and make uh, preparations because it's a response basically to a event uh, that has just happened and there's no time to notify. In fact, international law doesn't require notification, it is just a facilitatory a tool um, to make sure that protests go ahead peacefully and are protected by the law enforcement. In terms of counter demonstrations, which perhaps you have also um, touched upon, whereby um, persons who do not agree with the main protest go out, they are also protected by um, the freedom of assembly um, right under international law. And that's uh, indeed, it's something that uh, is protected in its own right, um, while the police and law enforcement need to ensure that they prevent undue disruption to the main assembly, which they are opposing. So there is a very complicated yet doable task for the law enforcement to make sure basically that these assemblies can see each other and be with insight and sound, but not, not um, in disturb um, one or the other. Um, in general, I think what uh, what has been mentioned already, which part of the conversation which I caught, was that there has been some show and some use of force um, by police in Poland um, during these protests. And um, the recent UN document on um, less lethal weapons in law enforcement addresses assemblies in particular when it comes to the use um, of force and use of certain uh, weapons such as projectile bullets, uh, rubber bullets, uh, tear gas, um, etc., in order to uh, contain or disperse protest. Um, and here, international law is very clear that use of force is absolutely the last resort that should be used by police, and that states are obliged to de escalate the violence as far as possible to minimize the risk of violence, and they should always be um, uh, wary of the fact that heavy displays of any kind of less lethal weapons may actually do the opposite, so escalate the tensions during assemblies instead of de-escalate the tensions. Therefore, the, the go-to uh, motto is that do not use violence, or do not use force, excuse me, unless there is an imminent threat to public order of extreme violence. And I think there is also a very um, deep understanding now on both the UN level, but also the Council of Europe level, that any weapon used by the police is can be lethal if used in a certain way. So even tear gas can cause permanent damage or permanent harm, or such as taser guns and other, um, other equipment. Um, on 
online protest, just to wrap it up and, and bring it back to your question, Barbara, and that is um, most recently, and ECNL has been very involved in the drafting and adoption of general comment number 37 by the Human Rights Committee. Now, this comment has been in the making for a very long time because it is an interpretative document of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, and that is in particular Article 21 on Freedom of Assembly. And there, discussions were lengthy and very drawn out um, to, show, uh, to uh, arrive at a conclusion whether or not you can actually take uh, or have an assembly online or wholly or partially. So we know that online um, platforms and means are used to mobilize people, to facilitate assemblies, to gather um, participants that eventually go out into the streets. We know also from protests in Spain and in other countries that new uh, technologies such as applications which uh, may guide protesters where there is violence, where they should go, have, are being used. So these are the new technologies that are being used in order to facilitate the protest by organizers and sometimes by authorities as well. However, there was always the question around whether or not you can protest only online. And here there is an example actually from the current protest, where, which uh, I received as one of the people interested, you know, both legally but also somehow uh, politically and emotionally in what is happening in Poland is that uh, there was a call for basically writing to MPs and the Constitutional Tribunal in very, very large numbers in order to sort of flood these institutions with protest messages. Now, this general comment, the UN in 2020, so just earlier this year, has absolutely um, given, uh, well, has recognized that assemblies can happen outdoors, indoors, but also online, and that new technologies offer the opportunity to assemble either wholly, but also partly online, and play an integral role in organizing and participating and monitoring physical gatherings, and that, indeed, the state has uh, an obligation not to interfere with such communications and therefore impede the right of assembly. So this has been uh, largely recognized. Now, my final point um, that I wanted to make perhaps uh, is the one, and I'm not sure, please stop me if you have already discussed this, and that's the one of um, coronavirus and protest. And now we know that uh, freedom of assembly is not an absolute right, uh, which means that there are some limitations that are permissible under the law. It's a very exhaustive, it's an exhaustive and limited set of limitations. However, uh, public health and safety is one of them. However, um, in view of the fact that there has been many protests, not just in Poland, throughout the pandemic, um, the UN Special Rapporteur, Mr. Clement Volet, has already said that, indeed, a pandemic does not need to hold freedoms of assembly and association. You can have an assembly, as has been done in Poland, with masks, with some social distancing, if possible, um, and in basically in order to keep the safety um, and to not bar assemblies from happening simply because there is a, a health concern. So um, ECNL has also come up with some uh, tools and resources that might be interesting for participants to this meeting of what states must not do um, in order to preserve a healthy civic space even during a pandemic. And if you go to the website, um, you can find um, tools and uh, information about how international law can work in favour of both maintaining um, health, health and safety, but also um, allowing for assemblies to go ahead, as has actually been the case in Poland. So um, that pretty much <laughs> sums up what I wanted to say in terms of international law. Another interesting point that maybe people have noted um, in Poland, which I didn't include um, in my presentation was the fact that uh, we have seen that some police have also joined the protest. And that's another interesting uh, question for international law, where the neutrality of police must be maintained. But on the other hand, they too have the right to assemble. So there's an interesting 
um, conundrum there you know, under international law, which, uh, which which can be discussed. And that would be all from me. Um, if you would like to open the floor for, for um, questions and answers, I'd be happy also to hear them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marta, for this very informative presentation. It's uh, really very useful to know. Uh, uh, I'm looking at Hannah to see if we have any questions from the chat, but uh, we can also open up a discussion uh, this time, uh, wrapping up discussion for real, um, yes. in response to your presentation too. So from other speakers, if there is anything to add or comment on what Marta said, feel free to, uh, to do so. Mm. I have a question, not from Chad, but from myself. Uh, whether you think that online protests are the same effective as the protests in person? Uh, I don't know if they are as visible for the powers from government as protests on the streets. Marta, did you hear? Um, yeah, yes, I heard the question. Thank you for the question. And that's something that um, <laughs> has come up in discussion, it's extremely on point. Um, it's difficult to say how effective uh, the protest, uh, simply an online protest, uh, is, right? Uh, but, you know, for lack of better options, if it does happen only online, um, that still should be protected. So the question really under international law isn't, does it work? Will it work? The question is that if somebody wants to do it, should they be protected under the law and should they have recourse? And the answer is always yes. But whether or not it works, I think it really depends. Now, there is a case uh, from 2012 in, um, in Germany where uh, there were um, people protesting by sending, like they were calling for sending in uh, emails and flooding uh, the authorities and the constitutional court in Poland. This was a case of Lufthansa who were involved in um, returning migrants for the government back to their to their home countries. Now people were not very happy with that, so they decided to let's say email bomb Lufthansa and flood its services for, for tickets, for buying tickets, right? Uh, for a number of hours. And the court for other reasons found that this, there was nothing wrong with that and that, that was a legitimate form of protest, which in fact cost the company some money, so it wasn't insignificant. So I think um, it's, it doesn't have the same effect, perhaps, as, you know, 100,000 people on the street like we saw in Warsaw or help in, in uh, last week. But still, I think it does have economic implications. It, it has implications on the rights of others to access information, which is a, you know, a, right, a, a duty of the state to provide it. So I think it does have an impact, but probably not the same and cannot be measured in the same way as, as a real-life street project. Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, Hannah uh, or uh, other speakers, uh, would you like to add anything? Paula. Um, so just very briefly on kind of two points, I guess we are in this debate rather kind of opening up a lot of paths of what can be discussed and analyzed. So uh, it's not in a conclusive manner, but just to flag issues. Uh, so two more issues that uh, about the um, the strong language that there are also social psychologists such as Michael Billig who talk about the role of ri ridicule and humor in the society kind of and also in making certain things like basically reaching the mainstream if there is uh, the ridicule on the humor aspect so that's also kind of one way of uh, of seeing the um, uh, the bold language uh, and the creativity of uh, of the protest banners and the things so and uh, and also on the um, the online dimension i guess it it doesn't fully overlap, but there is also the, the issue of like participation of the, the younger generation that uh, there are a lot of um, there's a lot of talk about the jaders, so like about the, the boomers, I guess would be the English equivalent um, here. So the rejection in a way of the ways the ways that the older generation does things. And there is a lot of activism uh, from uh, 
um, Polish um, activist below 20, yes, uh, which is something that um, also in terms of even election participation has not been high of this group. So there seems to be also a different social mobilization that is probably connected to the online platforms, definitely. And this is just to flag more issues. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. No, Thank I you, would, I would, go go I, on, Marta, sorry. please. Yeah, I just wanted to to um, reconfirm that that you know, I mean, the recognition at least the international law and all the discussions that uh, have taken place around this, you know, there was a lot of um, question marks whether or not it's really something that happens online and can be protected by international law. But it's just that, um, as has just been said, you know, I mean, it has motivated or activated different parts of society that perhaps the streets might not. So people who don't want to go out because they're worried about the pandemic or because they're sick or because they're working or because they're overseas like me can join, you know, um, can join the protest in a different way and have some kind of impact on what is happening. So I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's not to be excluded that this is a new way of, of, you know, joining and it's a new way of participation that perhaps mobilizes more people than would an ordinary demonstration that goes uh, to the street because you basically have to be there. Um, and also with regards to the, the foul language, yes, I mean the benchmark in international law is quite low so you can really, you, you should be able to express yourself in any way possible as long as it doesn't call for violence um, and incite to, to violence or violent acts against others. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Marta. I uh, now would like to wrap up the whole discussion. And first, let me start by thanking all participants uh, and speakers, uh, foremostly, uh, for uh, their interventions, interventions, their opinions. And uh, we have faced a number of technical challenges today. I think it was the most challenging panel for me to moderate. Uh, that being said, we, we went through this and our discussion, although more improv than originally planned. I think it was very interesting and it opened up a lot of uh, further topics for us to explore. So uh, thank you again all speakers uh, for sharing your views uh, and of course all participants. And I would like to conclude by saying that the Center of Expertise Global Governance at the Hague uh, University of Applied Sciences and the Lectorate Multilevel Regulation is very interested in uh, bringing this discussion further, the discussion on the rule of law challenges and women rights in Poland. I marked, I wrote down a few topics for potential discussion, but please remember that we are here for you students foremostly. So if you are interested in further discussions, if you would like to hear from other experts, if there is something that is particularly relevant for you and you don't understand it and you would like us to explain it, to you, we are very happy to do so. And please feel free to email me. You can find my email address on the website of the Center of Expertise Global Governance, and we will also type it in here through the chat. And we will be ha very happy to organize another session, which is already coming up at the end of November uh, with uh, other speakers, especially to understand the Dutch perspective of the protests. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank very much Hannah Falkiewicz and Deborah Spinabelli for uh, helping us out with the moderation and organization of this event. So, uh, Marta, I'm disconnecting uh, with you too. And thank uh, you very much. Thank you again. Thank all you. For, and apologies for, for all the technical difficulties. I'm sorry that we it also apologize. That's what we face these days. So I wish everyone a very nice afternoon and uh, we hope to keep in touch. Thank you.